Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Today, I'm continuing my conversations with Brother Jason Jack. And this is a, a continuance of our series, uh, 101 Verses Proving Faith Alone. Now, I think we're on, out of 101, I think we're on roughly number 70 now. So we've done a lot of videos on this. I hope you'll go back and watch this series from the beginning. Those videos are available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. So we're, I'm ready to get started. Uh, Brother Jason Jack, anything you want to say first? No, today was a lot easier getting the audio video up and running. So I think I've got the hang of this now. All right, real good. Okay, the verse we're beginning with today is Romans 5.10, if I'm correct. Is that right? That's right. Okay. It says, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Okay. All right. So yeah, so this is Paul speaking to the Romans, and you know, this is right after Romans 5 8, which we use a lot in soul winning and part of the Romans Road, which says, But God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But I think another very important verse to understand in this context of Romans 5.10 is verse 1, which states, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're justified by faith through Jesus Christ, by Jesus Christ. And so Paul is showing us now how this faith has reconciled us to God through the person of Jesus Christ. God manifests in the flesh. So he says, for if, or because if we were, we were enemies, you know, we were, um, you know, not in a right relationship with God, but now by the death of his son, by Jesus Christ dying on the cross, the just for the unjust dying for our sins, that we are now reconciled. We are restored into that right relationship, but much more by being reconciled in that right relationship, we shall be saved by his life. So, you know, just like first John five twenty, Jesus is the true God and eternal life. He overcame death for us through his resurrection. And that is how, we receive eternal life by being in him being crucified in christ nevertheless we live we're quickened by the spirit um and it goes on in verse 11 and not only so but we also joy in god through our lord jesus christ by whom we have now received the atonement so you know the atonement you know to be a to atone for something is like a restitution you know it goes in this along the same lines as reconciliation it's a restoration of something something given back to its proper owner if you will and that is kind of like that um how you showed the other day of um us being here and having that separation through sin but then through Jesus Christ being restored back into that right relationship, that is the restitution or atonement that can only be found in Jesus Christ. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, maybe you can help me remember who, who's the brother that likes to make a lot of comments uh, on our videos. And he, he wants to really make the distinction in all these words. Uh, he wants us to find all these terms. Uh, do you remember what is his name now? I'm sorry if he watches this. I'm sorry I, I forgot. But yeah, um, man, you. He hasn't I'm, commented. He hasn't commented recently, so I forgot. Out of sight, out of mind, I guess. But um, I, I think that this verse here, uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it seems like there is a distinction here. Just within this verse, there's a difference between reconciliation and salvation. 
And um, it says that we're reconciled by the death of his son. And so getting back to what I said last time about uh, at, at the death of Jesus on the cross, as he died, the record shows that there was an earthquake in Jerusalem. The temple shook and the curtain in the temple separating the public area from the Holy of Holies, that curtain was torn from top to bottom and opened up. And that was symbolic of the uh, the curtain being uh, representing the separation of God and man and uh, because of sin. But now the separation was opened up and now there's access. That to me is reconciliation at his death. And I have a video titled um, Universal Reconciliation, but not Universal Salvation. And I, I, I don't think everybody's going to agree with me on this, but, but according to this verse here, I think this is the point the verse is making, is that at his death, we have reconciliation. Uh, but we don't have uh, salvation at that point. I mean, when he died, the whole world was reconciled. The Bible says he doesn't hold sins against us anymore. I don't think he's talking about just believers. I think he's talking about the whole world. The whole world, all of our sins, God's not holding it against us. God and mankind is reconciled. Uh, uh, now, it's like, let's say that in our friendship, let's say that we, we had a falling out. And uh, uh, then we got reconciled. There was peace between, between us. And uh, when I saw you for the first time, you said, here's a gift for you. And I could now I can accept the gift. I couldn't even accept the gift because we weren't even, we were separated. Okay, but now now that we've been reconciled, I I, I can have this. Um, I have access to you, and now you've got a gift for me. And that that's how it is with Jesus at the cross. The whole world was reconciled, and now they have access to Jesus. And as soon as they put their faith in Him and call on the name of the Lord, the gift of eternal life is given to them. Uh, so. I, I don't know. That's how I see it. What do you say? Yeah. And yeah, I, th I think that's correct. And, you know, Colossians 1 20 says, and have him made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself by him. I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works yet now hath he reconciled. So, He's reconciled all of creation um, through um, through what God did, and but to receive that restoration, we must be in Christ, who is our Creator. But in order for Him to be our Savior and to and for us to be restored in that right relationship with God, we must put our faith in what He did for us. Mm -hmm. it's, I'm always amazed by how you were always able to find the right verse at the right time so so quickly <laughs> I, I, know <laughs> I, I have vague confused thought memories of verses and i rather than knowing where it is and being able to pull it up exactly i have to i have to give you a, my paraphrase of a verse all the time <laughs> you paraphrase as quickly as i can look it up and better so okay so um Let's look at one other thing in this verse. It says, when we were enemies, uh, we were reconciled to God by his death, the death of his son, much more being reconciled. Now that we're reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Um, of course, what we're looking for in this study is, um, is there any mention of works? Um, if it says you'll be, you'll be saved Say you're saved by his life. You're saved by believing. You're saved by your faith. All these different ways that the Bible expresses the same thing. Uh, and then, the, but the verse does not say any more. It just says, like we said in the last study, it says, "Period." Uh, what what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Period. Now, 
if if that was not enough just to believe on jesus which means to trust in him rely upon him depend on him to to get you to heaven um if that wasn't enough then the writer would uh have to be either um it's malpractice doctor or it's uh it's um uh, negligence uh on the on the writer's part to not to leave out something that you, you should you should be told because believing is not enough so if they didn't tell you what else is required then they've been negligent um so that's the only way out of, of saying that um well, more is required so here's another verse it's talking about being saved and, and but it's not there's no mention of changing your life and turning over your life to jesus and making him your lord and, and uh, selling everything you own and giving to the poor and following him none of these things are, are mentioned in these verses it's just as period yeah and you know in context you know i went back to romans 5 1 being justified by faith we have peace with god through our lord jesus christ but if you continue verse 2 by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So, you know, there's no mention of our own efforts or our works or anything like that. It's placing our faith, having, having access into God's grace, his unmerited favor by our faith um, and being justified in it, in our faith, um, being reconciled and being restored in that right relationship so that we can have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. As again, it states in Romans 5, 1. So obviously no mention of works anywhere in this uh, passage. Yeah. Well, you know, I've said it before, but I don't know. I, I, I have, um, I've had some friends on YouTube over the years that, you know, it doesn't take very much for, a Christian to turn on another Christian, right? you know, that to me, that sad state of YouTube uh, ministry. Um, but I've had some people that otherwise I would, I could collaborate with them. Uh, you know, I agree with them for the most part, but uh, they uh, find something that it is intolerable that I, I, I've said. And uh, I, I believe and I teach, that a person can be saved from a single verse. I believe that in Acts 16, 31, or this verse here, or a hundred verses like it, that there's enough information in that single verse to be saved. But then I've had people turn on me and say, no, uh, single verse salvation is, uh, you know, uh, heresy. You, you need a whole a list of uh, things, and there's a lot more content that has to be uh, like a, a whole gospel presentation, like like you'd like to do if you had the time. Uh, you're going to tell everybody about uh, the fall of man, and that there's one God, and He's triune, and He became a man, and He died for us, and He raised from the dead, and it's a free gift. And you have a whole list of things you want to explain to someone so they can understand everything, and it all makes sense. But if the person was not privy to all those facts, all that information, and they simply knew that the Bible says that if I believe on Jesus, I'll be saved. I get to go to heaven if I just believe on Jesus. And what's that mean? I'm going to depend on him to get me there. Okay. Then that's enough. Uh, that's what I think. But unfortunately, well, I can understand some people that will say, no, they have to have more information. Uh, I, I, I think that's that's wrong, but uh, some people, they, uh, as I said, people are just nitpicking and trying to uh, scrutinize and, and uh, uh, find any fault in other believers. That's, uh, I probably harp on that too much, but it's, I kind of, I got a lot of wounds over the last nine years on YouTube and <laughs> fall, friends and people falling out and it's always over just people wanting to to uh, pick each other apart with criticism. All right, you ready for the next one or anything Anything you want to say about my comment or? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's, I think that's, that's good enough for me. That's good enough for the world. All right then, but the next verse is John 6, 28, 29. Then said they unto him, 
what shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. So this is this is basically God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, discussing what the work of God is, that he reconciled us through Jesus Christ, you know, by himself. Again, as, as we saw in 2 Corinthians 5, he reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. That's the work of God is Jesus Christ, you know, that he reconciled the world through the person of Jesus Christ, that he manifests in the flesh and was the sacrifice for our sins, that he died on the cross and overcame death through his resurrection. That's the work of God. You know, I've seen this verse used where people try to say that this teaches that faith is a work, and that's absolutely false. I mean, we see so many verses, dozens and dozens and dozens of verses that show that faith is the opposite of works, and it's used in that context. You know, obviously Ephesians 2, 8, 9, um, those type of verses come to mind, but, you know, the, the way to, again, receive salvation, receive the free gift of eternal life is through Jesus Christ. And that comes by believing on him. Uh, and so that's, that's why this verse is in there, uh, because it's by believing on Jesus Christ. Uh, just like we just mentioned in at 1631. Uh, this is like Acts 1631. Uh, this is uh, one of my favorite verses for evangelism to teach people how to be saved. Because in Acts, we can say, this is Paul's answer to the question. What must I do to be saved? My paraphrasing, what's required of me to go to heaven? What does God require of me? And Paul says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all that's required. Okay. And then Jesus is asked the same question. It's, it's phrased differently, but it's the same thing. They're asking what is required of them? What does God require of them? Um, and, but here they are, they're thinking, they're using the word work because they're religious. And they, they believe, and uh, just like almost everybody in the world today, and everybody throughout history, has believed that it's it's our, our only work that will get us to heaven. We work our way to heaven, we climb that ladder, we struggle and persist until we get to heaven through our, all our efforts. And so they, they call it working, works. But the interesting thing here is that the, the people who ask the question are say works, plural, because they're thinking that there's a lot of different things that God's gonna expect me to do. I mean. It can't be so simple that there's just a work. There's one thing. Uh, no, there's got to be a, a list of works that I need to do if I'm going to go to heaven. But then when Jesus answered, he makes it singular. This is the work of God. This is, this is if we, if we ch change the word work. Now, work, of course, is great for this study because um, uh, that the whole point of the study is to, to show well, are works required for salvation? That's the question. Or is faith alone satisfactory? So the, we find the word work and works and work in here, so it's perfect for this purpose. But really what the word work means is it's what's required of us. But Jesus said there's work. The work of God is this. The one thing that's required, it's singular, not plural, not a list of things you've got to do and keep your fingers crossed and hoping that, you know, You've done enough and God will accept you. No, there's one work, one requirement. Believe on the one he has sent. Who did God send, brother? Who did he send? Amen, Jesus Christ. Hmm. So uh, I have a video titled um, uh, How to Check Me to Work Heretic in Three Moves. And uh, uh, basically, I, 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 I say that and I, I have brother Frank who used to do my street preaching with me. Uh, he plays the, the works heretic. 
we're kind of doing a little skit. And uh, uh, he's telling me that, uh, uh, I say, well, what do I have to do to be saved then? And, and he says, uh, you've got to uh, do works to be saved. And then I said, well, and then what, what are the works exactly? And he gives me a list. Well, you got to repent of your sins and change your life and, and go to church and study and, and all these things. And he gives me this list of things. I say, well, it's interesting because the two questions I asked you are exactly the two questions that were asked in the Bible. The first was asked of Paul. Uh, what must I do to be saved? And when I asked you, what must I do to be saved? You said, you've got to uh, do, do religious works. And then I asked you, well, what works are required? That's the question the Pharisees asked Jesus. And Jesus' answer was, the work of God is this, believe on the one he sent. So uh, the, the works heretic was proven to be wrong biblically he did not answer the same way Paul did, and then he did not answer the way, same way Jesus did. And I, I say, Paul and Jesus have the answer, not your, you know, a works heretic preacher. All right, uh, any more before we go to the next verse? Um, I mean, we could, we could look at verse 35, but we've already, you know, because basically the Pharisees continue to, press Jesus and ask him, you know, show us a sign. What does thou work? You know, they still don't believe uh, in him and, and start talking about the manna in the desert. And they want a sign like that, you know, that their fathers had. And, um, and Jesus says that he's, you know, ultimately says he's the bread of life. You know, he that cometh to me shall never hunger and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Um, so that, I love that verse. And then, you know, as we've talked about many times, this leads into John 6, 37 through 40, which um, are great eternal security in Christ verses and what the will of the Father is in terms of salvation is that those who see at the Son and believe on him, believe on him may have everlasting life. And that they will, and that he will raise them up at the last day. That's the will of the Father. Mm -hmm. Now, when you referenced uh, verse thirty-five, uh, I thought you were going to go into uh, when they demanded the sign that Jesus said, "The only sign I'll give you is the sign of Jonah," that I discussed last time. But that I guess that's a different portion of John, isn't it? Because I know it's near the end of John. Um, so that that uh, reference of Jesus saying the sign of Jonah is what I'll give you. And that's not in, in the same part portion manner. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This is, this is um, him talking about, you know, after they wanted to, they, you know, the Pharisees referenced the, the manna. Um, so he referenced himself as the bread of life from God. Um, I think the sign of Jonas is in, Matt is in Matthew. Like, let me. I can search it. Yeah. Matthew. Matthew twelve. Yeah. Um, is and then again in Matthew sixteen. Uh, uh, I believe it's also in John uh, because I, I did a verse by verse teaching on John, and uh, uh, of course, having read it many times, but when it, when you really try to analyze each verse and, and, and think and teach teach the verse, uh, it makes you really, uh, you know. Uh, one thing about teaching is it helps you understand it because uh, you're trying to teach someone else to someone else, so you're forced to try to figure it out better, you know? Right. So, um, uh, but I, I found out from doing that verse by verse teaching on John that um, when they wanted Jesus to go back into the town, uh, and, and he, he said, uh, no, he wasn't going to go back in town yet because they're trying to kill him. And, uh, but he was talking about all the different miracles that he was doing. Uh, so he did all these miracles, and he said the purpose of doing all the miracles were, were signs. But when he was challenged both times that I remember, now this is another time you've just mentioned here, but uh, in the, I believe it's the first chapter of John, and then again in, near the end of John, when Jesus is challenged by the Pharisaical leaders, give us a sign. Uh, Near the end of John, 
he cites the, the, the uh, death, burial, and resurrection and illustrated by uh, Jonah and the whale. And then, but in the first chapter, I think, they, he says, um, dis destroy this temple, and in three days I'll build it up, uh, I'll raise it up. And they said, well, how could you build a temple in three days? It took our fathers 40 years to build a temple. And then the scriptures say, he's talking about uh, his bodily, his body, uh, his death, burial, and resurrection. So there's twice there, it seems to me that when he's, they're trying to force him to give him a sign. He refuses to give him a sign except pointing to the fact that eventually I'm going to give you the ultimate sign, my death, burial, and resurrection. Um, but when he's not forced, when they're not trying to force it out of him, he's very willing to give, perform all kinds of miracles. And the real purpose of the miracle, yes, he loves us and wants to heal us and do good things and, and, and give us an example of serving our fellow man. But the main purpose of Jesus' miracles were signs to prove who he is. So he very voluntarily gave him, gave him like, I don't know. I don't know how many miracles he did. Uh, but at one point, he's in a town healing everybody, and it said he healed everybody. He might have healed 100 people in that town that day. I don't know. Uh, but uh, so there's plenty of miracles he did that were all served as signs. All right. Uh, any more? I want to go to the next verse. Sure. Okay. This is 1 Peter 3.18. Uh for Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. This is interesting. This verse, I, I discussed this verse in a video earlier today when um, I did a video on five verses that um, are spiritual discerners of the heart. And I use this verse in conjunction with other verses on baptism, how somebody that um, isn't, is basically reading the Bible with natural glasses, with earthly glasses, who doesn't have spiritual discernment, they see the word baptism and they think of water baptism every time. And that leads to the teaching of baptismal regeneration. I know that doesn't have anything to do with the study other than that is a work that some people teach as part of the gospel, as part of things that we must do for salvation. And this study being that that's not or anything else that we do is part of salvation other than placing our faith in Jesus Christ. So with all that said, going back to verse 18, it discusses basically the gospel, you know. Christ died for our sins, and he is the perfect sacrifice, the just for the unjust. He led a sinless life um, and overcame death for us. He brings us to God through this work that he did. That is the work of God, uh, is Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection, that he manifests in the flesh and, and died for our sins and overcame death for us. That's the work that we believe in. Um, and this bringing us to God again, you know, we keep these, it's funny how these same words keep coming up over and over, you know, reconciliation, restitution, atonement, um, you know, rest, um, you know, all these, all these words. Um, and then he was put to death in the flesh, just like we will die physically in this mortal flesh, but yet made alive by the spirit. And that is our blessed hope that by being in Christ, you know, you mentioned last night, actually, at the end, when we were talking about that passage in Romans, which was um, an awesome ending to the video where you were talking about justified, um, you know, justification of faith that the apostles, they were justified in their faith by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They could trust that he was who he said he was, the Messiah, the one to come, because of his death, burial, and resurrection. Their faith was justified in him because of what Jesus did. 
And in the same sense, by his resurrection, which we see in verse 21, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, um, you know, that verse 21 is referring back to verse 18, quickened by the spirit. And that's the same way that we are made alive and receive eternal life. We are buried with Christ in baptism through our faith, the spiritual baptism by the spirit, which quickens us as it's quick, as it quickened Jesus Christ, um, with the bodily resurrection. So, um, the gospel is right there in verse 18. Um, but you know, people that want to teach works and baptismal regeneration will completely miss that and start talking about how, um, water baptism saves us. Hmm. Well, well, what is interesting to me here is the, uh, is the uh, word quicken. Word quicken. I'm getting okay. feedback, so maybe you better mute your mic. Can you okay. mute your mic for a minute? Because, uh, or turn your volume down or something. I don't get it. All right. Um, when it says quickened, um, I don't know where it is, but there's another time we find the word quickened talking about uh, our new birth. And, and then this time, the word quickened is talking about the bodily resurrection. So it's, it's interesting. To me, the word quickened means being brought to life, like instantly, that quick, quickly, all of a sudden there's life. Uh, like spontaneous generation, life, life comes into existence. Well, uh, when we put our faith in Jesus, our spirit is quickened and brought to life. Now we're spiritually born again, spiritually alive. Uh, whereas in this case, it's talking about uh, quickened that, same thing, being brought to life, but it's the physical uh, being brought to life physically of Jesus. Um, but the uh, as far as the, this study is, uh, yeah, you've got uh, the, the death and the uh, payment for our sins, the just, the just means that um, he's innocent, declared innocent, Jesus is innocent. Jesus even said, who, who can, can convict me of any sin? Or uh, I forgot exactly how he said it, but, he, you know, I mean, if anybody else said that, I mean, it would be the height of arrogance and egotism and stuff. But Jesus came out and said, you know, basically said, I've never sinned. Uh, I, I would never dare say that. Uh, in all my evangelism and witnessing, um, I only came across that maybe once or twice to someone who was an absolute nut, you know. So you'd have to either be insane <laughs> or deceiving yourself, uh, or Jesus can legitimately say, no, he, he never sinned. He was the only just person. Uh, and it took him, uh, it being without sin, to pay for our sins. If he had his own sins, he couldn't have paid for ours. Uh, uh, he would have had to die you know, as we we die because of our own sins. Um, uh, and, of course, the unjust is us uh, because that means before we put our faith in Jesus, that's what God says about us and, and sees us as you're not just, you're not good, you're not righteous. Uh, uh, and then when we put our faith in Jesus, we are justified, just as if we'd never sinned, God says. Um and then we got uh, being put to death by the flesh. So he died uh, bodily, but quickened by the spirit. Uh, now, I don't know where they are. Like, you could probably tell me exactly where these verses are. Uh, but uh, right here, this verse is telling me that Jesus' bodily resurrection was done by the Holy Spirit. If I'm reading that correctly, it says he was quickened, he was resurrected, brought back to life bodily by the Spirit. So that's the Holy Spirit working to do it. He also said, uh, when, when he talked about his resurrection himself, he said that he would raise himself back to life. So, you know, the, it, the scripture says the Spirit raised Jesus to life. Jesus said he would raise himself to life. And there's another point where it says the Father raised him to life. So this resurrection seems to me as a, a collaboration of the whole Godhead uh, raising Jesus bodily. 
Anything else? Um, I may do a video on my channel on this passage uh, later because I've already mentioned it and then it just showed up here and I'm just looking at it in verse 18 and verse 21 together um, really show the gospel of Jesus Christ um, so well and, and not that we're saved by water baptism. So I'll probably make that point later this evening on a short video. Uh, you asked me yesterday uh, when I was talking about the um, uh, Joan and the whale and, and also being just uh, the resurrection being the word justified applying to their faith being justified rather than their salvation being justified. And when we were discussing all that, you asked me if I'd ever made a video on that. And uh, I said, I know I've mentioned it in numerous times in my videos. But I, I do remember that, um, you know, if you go to my home page now, I, I'm always constantly um, trying to tweak it. And um, I'm rearranging things, trying to make it the best I can. And I, I just today put on the home page when you can, we, you can kind of feature certain playlists. I feature now my verse by verse commentary on John. So I hope everybody will watch that because I've said a hundred times that. Uh, reading and learning the gospel John is probably the most important thing that every believer needs to to do um, uh, so, but in that verse by verse teaching when when that uh, subject comes up in the verses that that's where you'll find me talking about what I said yesterday all that is explained in there again so uh, now I'm going to post the next verse. Oh, by the way, you mentioned your verse, you, the video you did today. And uh, you know the feature you have on your on your videos where you can click uh, add to or something and you can add to watch later. Do you, do you ever use that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I have my watch later playlist. And I put that video on my watch later. So I'm planning on watching that tonight. But I just haven't gotten around to it yet today. Otherwise, I would know more about you know what you're just talking about uh, and by the way I read the book of Jonah last night after we got off um, our video and you know we're, we're you know we're just talking about the son of Jonas um, in, in Matthew and Luke and um, you know that Jesus said that just like Jonas was in the well the belly for three days and three nights so shall the son of the man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. Uh, and you mentioned that in order for it to be a true, um, you know, sort of a, a true mirror of uh, um, a shadow of things to come that Jonah uh, would also uh, be dead in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights. And, and so I read um, Jonah and you're absolutely right. Um, at the end of Jonah 1, it describes Jonah being um, swallowed by a great fish. And, you know, let me just go to it real fast because this was really a great revelation to me last night. So the last verse in Jonah 1, 17 says, Now the Lord hath prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then, so he was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. Then the beginning of chapter two says, then Jonah prayed unto the Lord as God out of the fish's belly. And it goes into Jonah's prayer. I think that he was, like you said, he was dead for three days and three nights. Then he was quickened, he was made alive, and then prayed this prayer. And within this prayer, in verse 6, at the end, it says, Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. You know, and corruption being uh, oftentimes spoken of as, as being dead, something non-living. Um, and, and then the last verse of, Jonah 2 verse 10 says, and the Lord spake unto the fish and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Um, so, you know, I, I think what you said yesterday 
about that, um, that really um, hits home with the um, prophecies of Jesus himself when he was speaking of himself um, and his um, crucifixion that was to come in his burial for three days and three nights and in his resurrection. Um, Jonah completely foreshadows the gospel. Hmm. Well, I got to tell you, when you were leading up to that, I was holding my breath, hoping, oh, I hope I'm not proven wrong, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, um, I, I seem to remember too uh, that uh, um, this, just as you gave that account here, that yeah, Jonah uh, had this prayer, but that to me was that he would he was dead. He wasn't saying that in alive inside the whale. But here's the key to me: it, it's I could very easily be wrong. You know, I've been wrong before. I'm positive. I'm still wrong on some theology. But Jesus can't be wrong. And when Jesus says just as, then it has to be just as. He says, just as Jonah was in the belly of the well for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. It has to be just as. And if Jesus, if we believe Jesus was dead in the tomb, Jonah had to be dead in his tomb, the well. Otherwise, Jesus couldn't have said, just as. All right. Uh, ready for the next verse? I'm ready. Okay. Oh, and, go, go ahead. Uh, Never, I was just thinking of, um, you know, the false theory of evolution and how that's being taught. Well, Jesus spoke of the creation, um, you know, but from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. And then he says again, and from the creation um, of the, from the beginning of the creation of the world, God, they, God made them man and male and female. So Jesus gives an account of, uh, the creation, you know, that since the beginning of the world of, of being male and female, not being, you know, a microorganism that then over billions of years um, I evolved into, um, you know, a fish, then an amphibian, a land mammal, then an ape, and then a uh, man. Um, and so that's proven false just by reading the book of Genesis, but also just, but also just like when Jesus is talking about the sign of Jonas, he's also verifying the Genesis account of creation in the gospels of uh, Matthew and Mark. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, um, it'd probably be an interesting study to uh, go through all the times that Jesus cites an Old Testament fable you know and and, and 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 basically is endorsing it as a, as a factual historical event you know so um all right the next verse matthew 5 20 uh for i say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and pharisees ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven so this is great. You know, this is this is within the Beatitudes that Jesus is speaking. And, you know, many of these uh, sayings were to, you know, oftentimes it will say, and he just, he taught with the disciples or the disciples, the followers, you know, he said these words. And, you know, I made a point of this, that Disciples, in this sense, just mean just means a following or a gathering or a crowd. You know, there were many people that were within this crowd of quote disciples that were listening to the ser you know the Sermon on the Mount and and you know Jesus saying that had put their trust in Him, had believed on Him, but there were many that hadn't, and then there were many that. We're trying to catch him in blaspheming the law or catch him into um, saying that he was God so that they could, um, you know, bring um, a witness, you know, a false witness against him and try to catch him in a lie, so to speak. Um, and so when he is speaking here, 
the, there are scribes and Pharisees within this group of people that he's speaking to. Um, so he's, he's kind of tongue in cheek pointing them out and saying, look around, look at all these religious leaders, these um, men that are giving you the law and telling you to do all these religious works. And look how, how they are keeping the law, they think, to a T. Um, but your righteousness has to be superior to what they're doing in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. So this must have been, you know, somebody that's trusting in their righteousness and what they were doing and the works of the law, the deeds of the law. Um, this must have just come as a shock to them that um, they had to do so much more than even these religious leaders. So obviously, what Jesus is saying, and this reminds us just like we were talking about last night in Matthew 19 of the rich young uh, man that called God, you know, good master, what shall I do to inherit the kingdom of heaven? And, you know, Jesus tells him, well, you know, keep the Ten Commandments in, in so many words, you know, and then do this and then sell all you have and give to the poor and follow me. Um, you know, he's basically showing that no matter what you do, it will never be enough. Our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in terms of salvation. Um, we can't merit eternal life with anything that we do. And so Jesus' words are pointing that out and at the same time pointing to himself who can give that person eternal life simply through believing on him. And, you know, this goes down a little further about, you know, if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it out, um, you know, so that one of your members should perish and not your whole body should cast into hell. And <laughs> Lordship salvation, you know, these, these people that trust in themselves and that they're righteous and that they're obedience to God is part of salvation. Well, Jesus has done his part and I know, and I believe in Jesus and you know, his, his death, burial and resurrection. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I also, you also have to be obedient and look how obedient I am by the works of law that I'm doing. And they'll point to these verses and say, look, Jesus is serious about sin. You got to repent of your sin. You not only have to believe, oh, you can't just say easy believism, just believe on him. You have to be serious about turning from your sin and doing this. And if you don't do it until death, then that shows that you're not saved and you're not entering the kingdom of heaven. But what Jesus is showing him in verse 20 that we, you know, that's on this list, but also in verse 29 and 30, where he talks about pluck out your eye and cut off your hand. He's saying, if you try to work your own righteousness, to walk up the stairway to heaven and climb that ladder up to heaven, so to speak, you're going to fall apart. You're going to be disembodied, disassembled by your efforts because you're never going to get there. Um, but so many people will look at these verses and, that are obviously saying that there's no works of the law that can justify you in God's eyes and say, well, I am more righteous than the Pharisees and scribes. Oh, I, I'm doing this, so I don't have to pluck my eye out. I don't lust upon anybody or look at anybody in spiritual adultery. Oh, I don't covet anything. Therefore, you know, I don't have to cut my hand off like somebody else who's obviously the sinner. Um, and this pride and this self-righteousness leads to spiritual blindness when reading these verses. Mm hmm well, the uh, I don't know if Jesus. I'm getting that feedback again, so you got to mute your mic. But uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I can't think of any time where Jesus is uh, complimentary and praising of the scribes and Pharisees. It, um, it's it's always uh, criticism, condemnation, ridicule. Uh, you know, we. I've been hard on some of our YouTube Christian 
brethren for you know not being ambassadors for Christ and behaving and acting in a way that's not really dignified and and uh, helpful. Uh, but uh, then people can say, well, look at Jesus did. Look, look how Jesus, Jesus, there's a kind of a famous uh, street preacher, uh, Reuben Israel. He's like the president of the Street Preachers Club of America. And uh, I know him very well. And he's, uh, he's done uh, all kinds of sermons talking about uh, name calling is biblical. And he likes to point out all the examples of Jesus and other times in the Bible where you call someone a name. I'm not in favor of that. Uh, I think that uh, we should not call each other names, and we should um, listen to, to what Paul says. If someone you have an enemy, uh, feed them, give them water, help them, uh, and, and uh, uh, pray for them, and, and bless them, and and it, it'll be like put burning coals on their head. And what that means is that when someone is really bad to you and you return it with evil for good they feel ashamed of themselves that's the that's the typical reaction uh, i've used that technique and it works uh, but the exception to this is the self-righteous religious hypocrites they need to be named and identified and and uh, uh, marked and avoided and the, these lordship works heretics uh today are i've said it Many YouTubers have called them modern day Pharisees. They're no different than the Pharisees, full of self righteousness and spiritual pride, and they deserve to be called just what Jesus called them snakes, vipers, whitewashed tombs, and hypocrites. All white on the outside, but inside dead men's bones. And, uh, so I'm, I'm in favor of uh, identifying them for what they are, um, just as Jesus did. Jesus was gentle and loving with prostitutes and tax collectors, but the scribes and the Pharisees, he let them have it. Um, another thing that I think is important to understand is uh, the scribes and Pharisees, and you mentioned the rich young ruler, uh, and, and also the, the one that uh, was uh, the Pharisee that was at the temple saying, look at me, look at all the wonderful things I've done. I'm not like this tax collector, you know. Uh, all these are examples of these people who think that somehow uh, personal merit is the way to get to heaven. And, but here's the weird thing about this. The, um, nowhere in the Old Testament does it say you get to go to heaven through personal merit. Uh, every time the laws and commandments are mentioned in the Old Testament, the Bible tells it, God has says to them, if you follow these commandments, I'll bless you. You'll get the land, you get prosperity, you get this and that, but never is following the commandments used as a means of gaining salvation. So, but, so how did that, at the time of Jesus, you can see that this is a popular viewpoint. All the religious people are thinking that that's how you get to heaven, being really religious. Well, Jesus told us that you're not following the scriptures, you're following the teachings and traditions of men. So what they're teaching at this time uh, are the teachings of all of these um, rabbis. And that's what the Talmud is, by the way. You know, a lot of people are not familiar. I didn't know that much about the Talmud until recently. But we know the Torah is the Old Testament. Uh, and then uh, we got the, the New Testament. And then there's a thing called the Talmud. And that's a huge collection of volumes and volumes, just like 30 encyclopedias. It's, it's the content of hundreds and hundreds of years of collection of writings from rabbis. And um, that's what Jesus is talking about. The teaching of all these rabbis, these traditions and rules and regulations that they set up. Uh, even you talk about you want to be, uh, you think you're as good as the as religious as the Pharisees? They would actually write down how many steps you could take before it was considered working on the on the Sabbath. Uh, you you would need to, to to move one an item from one place. You couldn't have an uh, uh, anything that was bigger than certain dimensions and more more than a certain weight, and couldn't carry it for more than a certain number of steps. Otherwise, you violated working on the Sabbath. Um, and yeah, you got to keep uh, God on your mind all the time. So they would take phylacteries. This is a word for a little box that they would put scriptures inside it, and they 
wrap it around their head so that they have the scriptures on their head and on, on their hearts so they put it on their arm here. All these things are the extreme uh, that they would go to to be religious. And Jesus said, you got to be more religious than them. In other words, you got to be perfect. And one way you got to do is you got to stop being self-righteous and, you know, thinking you're all that. You better get humble like the, like the tax collector that said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Be like that guy instead. Yeah, and so many times, you know, like Matthew 23, um, Jesus, you know, this is the woe to the scribes and Pharisees, you know, and, and just rebuking them over and over because they're trusting in themselves and not placing their faith in Jesus Christ. Um, and it just shows a heart of unbelief, a hardened heart. Um, you know, he is constantly calling them hypocrites, you know, which I did that study on hypocrisy and hypocrites. And every time in the Bible, 40 times in the King James, where either hypocrites or hypocrisy or a form of that word is used in the, in the King James Bible, it's always speaking of unbelievers or an unbelieving heart. And it said, like in Matthew 15, for instance, Jesus says to the scribes and Pharisees, ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophecy of you saying, this people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, but in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And so that's exactly what you're talking about. Um, you know, people who are trusting in being religious and these works and efforts. Ultimately, it's a heart of unbelief and hypocrisy and iniquity uh, because they haven't come to that acknowledgement of the truth of Jesus Christ and place in their faith and turn from those works to faith unto God. Um, you know, they're doing all these things in vain. Um, and uh, all these signs of, of worshiping and, you know, their praise is, you know, with men, not of God. Um, and ultimately, you know, that's who they're really seeking praise from, you know, to be puffed up and, and get the best seats in the, in the, you know, synagogues back in the first century AD. But, you know, nowadays uh, you see so many um, pastors, you know, if you see a famous pastor on TV or um, that has a congregation of, you know, 10 to 20,000, odds are he's tickling people's ears telling them what they want to hear or she um, nowadays and is not teaching the true gospel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, now, when we started the broadcast, um, I, I don't have a, I have a clock on the computer and up on my wall here, but I didn't make a mental notice to when we started. So I don't know if you know, and I don't know how we're doing on time. Are we getting near an hour? Do you know, are you know? Any idea? Hold on. Can you hear me? I put it on mute. Um, I'm looking. We may be close. I'm trying to see when I called you. Yeah, I'm not sure. It's probably pretty close. We can do one more, though. Okay, we'll do another verse. Uh, let me say one last thing here about this, this portion. Oh, by the way, you mentioned your verse on hypocrisy. I mean, your video on hypocrisy. And, you know, I... I just raved about it when I saw it, and I want to make sure that anybody who watches this video uh, gets re referred to that. Um, to me, what you said in that video was a revelation. Um, it was, I believe it was an epiphany that um, and all, all the books and all the teachings and studying I've done, I've never heard anybody have that particular take on it. And when I listened to it, I thought I was just blown away. So why don't you mention the name of it again? So anybody who's watching this, they can make a, they can make a note and make sure they find your video and watch it because it's really revolutionary. I made two videos. One is um, judge not, but is that possible? I phrase it as a question. And the other one is on, and I think I listed it as um, part of Matthew 7, um, judge not lest thee be judged or that ye be not judged, um, as it says in the King James. I'm trying to think exactly how that's worded, but 
it's basically the two videos I did last month on judging others. They're back to back on my channel. Okay. All right. Uh, one last thing on this last verse. Uh, uh, it says, in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. And I don't know. I'm, we could probably talk for an hour or two just on what I'm going to say now, but uh, just, I'll just introduce the idea. Maybe we can talk more about it some other time. But um, I, I've made a really big deal on my playlist, um, Paul Onlyism Debunked, and also my playlist on dispensationalism uh, about this term, kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God. Uh, there are some, some people... As a matter of fact, a lot of the people we probably know on YouTube right now, it's a very popular viewpoint that the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are not the same thing. They're two different things. Uh, and um, on my videos, I prove that these are interchangeable terms. They mean exactly the same thing. And I'm not going to try to prove it to everybody right now. You don't have to go watch my uh, videos on this. Um, but this kingdom of heaven... Uh, some people would say, well, see, that's not talking about Paul's gospel. That's not talking about salvation. That, that's talking about the uh, Jesus setting up his kingdom here, and, and it's a different gospel, the gospel of the kingdom. But the gospel of the kingdom is the same thing as the gospel of the grace of God. It's the same thing. Jesus said the kingdom is, is at hand, and then he said the kingdom is now. He says, you... The, the kingdom is not something where you say, low here or low there, there's the kingdom. He says, no, the kingdom is right here and now. It's within you. It's a spiritual thing. Uh, so when we put our faith in Jesus, we enter the kingdom right then. But the kingdom is, exists all now. It's been existing since the time of Jesus uh, until now, the kingdom of God. And that's what we become part of uh, when we put our faith in Jesus. Um, all right, so you still have time for this next verse? Sure. Okay. 1 John, oh, I, I'm sorry, I better say it correctly. 1 John. 1 John 2.2. 2. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. All right, and... You know, basically, you know, propitiation, um, and he is the propitiation for our sins. That means um, the atonement, uh, you know, which we just talked about, the appeasement. And, you know, God doesn't appease anybody else but himself. He appeased, you know, and reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. That is the propitiation for our sins. It's what Jesus Christ did, what God did manifest in the flesh, that he died for our sins. Um, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So everybody um, has their sins forgiven, but they must receive that forgiveness, that love, grace, mercy through faith in Jesus Christ. Um, and, you know, very similar to what we were talking about, about um, God reconciling the world to himself. Um through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ uh, on the cross. But in order to be reconciled with God, we must be in Christ, and that comes through faith in him. Um, and going back in verse 1, it says, My little children, the, these things are writing to you that you sin not. And this comes right after the end of 1 John um, 8 through 10, where talks about if those say that they have no sin, then they're a liar. Um, but if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and we receive his righteousness. It's not our righteousness, which we have done. It's his righteousness that we receive through faith. He's the only one that can overcome our sins because he was the just who had no sin, who died for the unjust us. And he is our advocate, just uh, like yesterday. We, we read in Hebrews 7.25, he's our intercessor. And then we looked in Hebrews 9, he's our mediator. Here, he's our advocate. Um, all these synonymous terms. Um, and I liked how 
you got up yesterday <laughs> and showed how Jesus would grab us by the hand through faith in him and bring us to the father. Um, that that's our mediator, our intercessor. And I like that. And it, you know, basically it says that here that he's our advocate. Um, and what he did, um, made appeasement for our sins to the father. Mm -hmm. Um, I made, I told you about some changes I'm always making. I'm, I, I continue trying to improve my, my YouTube channel. And I made another change today too. Some people might not think it's an improvement, but I uh, I removed some of the channels on my recommended list and I whittled it down. It's not because the other channels were not worthy. It's just that that I wanted to whittle it down to the people, a, a handful of people actually know. Because the other people, even though the quality of their channel is fantastic, I don't really know them. Uh, like Yankee Arnold, for example. I've never met Yankee Arnold. I've never talked to him. Uh, so I whittled it down, and there's only five on the list now. And the, the five are uh, uh, Jack Smack 77, Jason Jack, Renee Rowland, For the Most High Jesus, that's Lisa Harang. Her channel's For the Most High Jesus, and 777 New Covenant. Now, that, I used to have this 777 New Covenant uh, listed a, a different way, a different channel. It's called Aaron Budgen. But uh, this one is another Aaron Budgen channel, but it's, it's, it has a better collection of what I really want you to get from Aaron Budgen. And the reason I'm bringing this up now is because, matter of fact, I shared a video today on YouTube um, Aaron Budgen's video and it's titled Faith and Works. And you know, when you share a video, you can make a little statement that goes out with it. And I said something like, uh, this is the best gospel message that you'll ever find on YouTube. <laughs> that sounds pretty, pretty uh, bold kind of a claim, but that's how much I thought, thought think of that particular video, his message, and what, what we can gain from that. Uh, um, so Aaron Budgen is someone, no, I, don't, I don't know Aaron Budgen, so he, that kind of violates my rule I just said, I've never met him personally. But he is a, um, he's a pastor, he grew up, his he, he's a genealogy is Jewish, and he grew up learning, studying to be a rabbi, and as he studied, he believed that Jesus was the Messiah, and then eventually became a full uh, free gift free grace believer as we are. But he has um, a lot of knowledge that you and I don't have because of his vast knowledge of Judaism and the history of the, his people and stuff. He has insights that, that I'm not privy to. So I, I, I've gained a lot by listening to him. But the reason I mean bringing him up is because of this word propitiation. Now, the verse says, he is the propitiation for our sins. Now, in the in the past, um, I've I've used propitiation and um, atonement as uh, synonyms, interchangeable terms, and almost everybody probably considers them to be interchangeable. But uh, Aaron Budden has a video, and he goes to great lengths to teach us there is a difference between atonement and propitiation. And uh, watch his video if you want to know the distinction. Okay, I'm not going to try to explain it. Um, but this propitiation, it means that the sin problem is completely resolved. Jesus says it is finished. It means he's, the, the work of paying for sin is completed. It's the sin debt is paid in full, okay? So there is no more issue between mankind and God over sin. That's completely been removed. That's propitiation. Uh, and, uh, but it says here, He's the propitiation for our sins, I believe. Some people might argue, like a, a Calvinist would say, when it says our sins, it's talking about the Jews. And when it's when it's talking about uh, uh, for the sins of the whole world, it's talking about uh, non-Jews, Gentiles. But it doesn't mean that everybody in the world's sins are paid for. That's how Calvinists would say it. It's just all kinds of people all over the world that God has selected his, his, his elect from all over the world. 
<clears throat> not necessarily just Jews. But this verse is telling us that the sin of all humanity has been paid for. Uh, those of us who believe in Jesus, and even if you haven't believed in Jesus yet, the good news is Jesus paid for your sins. And we were talking about reconciliation and salvation earlier. So you, Jesus paid for your sins, so you, you and God are reconciled. God will accept you now. You can come to Jesus, but you won't have eternal life unless you get the gift of eternal life from Jesus by putting your faith in him. You've got to believe that Jesus is the only means for eternal life and, and this uh, future in heaven. That he's the only means of it. You need to put your faith completely in him to get it. He's paid for your sins. It'd be a shame if you wouldn't do the next thing and now just accept the gift. Uh, all right, brother. What are your thoughts on all that? Your, your uh, microphone is uh, muted. All right. Sorry. Um, you may want to put Yankee Arnold back on your list because I've met him. So you know him through me now. I went, I went to um, Tampa in January to see my beloved Crimson Tide get beat on a last second touchdown by Clemson in the national championship game. So that part of the trip wasn't that memorable or exciting. But the part that was memorable and exciting was going and going to a service that Sunday at Yankee Arnold's church and set through his Sunday school and then through uh, a worship service and talked to him afterwards. Uh, if I'd had more time, I was thinking about going to see him if he wanted to go to lunch with me. But it was an incredible experience, and he is such a um, – a great ambassador of Jesus Christ and the, the true gospel. So throw him back on your channel sometime, maybe. All right. I'll have to pray I'll, about I'll it. For him. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, anything else on this verse before we uh, summarize everything? No, I think we're probably well past time, but that was fun tonight. Yeah, time really flew by, so I, I completely lost track of time. I'm going to have to remember, to, or you're going to have to remember for me to, Make a note of when we start so we can try to close in an hour. I think this has probably gone over. I'm guessing we're probably an hour and 15 minutes. But go, go ahead, summarize it as you always do it, please. All right. Well, we started in the book of Romans that we are justified by faith through Jesus Christ and then reconciled to God by his death. Um, you know, looking at Romans 5 8, Romans 5 1 2, with verse 10. Uh, then going into John 6, 28 and 29, um, the Pharisees asked what all the works of God were. And Jesus said, this is the work of God and basically pointed to himself and that believing on him um, is the work of God. That's what we must do to be saved. Uh, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the work is jesus christ that god manifests in the flesh of uh, what he did for us he did all the work we basically trust and rest in what he did he did the work we rest in his work um then we talked about first peter three eighteen, how that showed the gospel message um and then in the matthew five twenty, uh in showing how Jesus was pointing to the scribes and Pharisees to show how religious works, however good they may think they're doing and keeping the law, that's never going to earn salvation. Um, that you have to, you'd have to exceed that. And nobody's going to exceed that because nobody's perfect. And if you fail to do one, then you, you know, you're the, you're, um, yeah, I'm trying to think of James two ten. Um, but anyway, um, you don't want to do the works of the law because if you fail at one point, you're guilty of all. I guess what I'm trying to say. And then uh, we finished up in First John two two, and with again um, Jesus Christ being the propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours but for the sins of the whole world, reminding us of John three sixteen, which I want to quote to finish this: um, the gospel message. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. All right, brother. Thanks a lot for joining me again. I was uh, 
happily surprised you called me and we're available again today. So I look forward to next time and to uh, all the viewers, uh, put your faith completely in Jesus. Do not put any faith in your own contribution. You're contributing nothing to salvation, but rely instead on what Jesus did for you and his promise of eternal life as a free gift. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.